Hi, this is Logan with Spiritual Danger Close Podcast. Normally episodes are the narration of my blogs which come from my thoughts on a particular subject. And learning of what it means to live spiritual danger close requires to have an open conversation with knowledgeable individuals. Today's episode reflects that idea and hopefully helps you with your spiritual discipline. Today's speaker was requested by me or those who follow the blog or podcast. If there's a conversation you'd like to hear or wanted to comment on today's episode, please do so. I hope you enjoy the conversation that you're about to listen to. Three, two, one. Hey, Adam, how's it going? It's going well, man. How are you? Uh, waking up still. <laughs> so this uh, time difference of Japan to your part in the u.s is really different so yeah it's like um, like 11 hours different something like that so yeah and uh <laughs> depending on if the states are doing um uh spring forward or spring back that throws right. into a thing too so that's just it's such a mess do they not do like daylight savings in japan you guys don't oh it's with that japan is i wish if the world had to be rebuilt i want the japanese <laughs> to have a spot at that table like that they're doing something some an asian country needs to be at that table if we're rebuilding things they'll, they'll do a lot of good things right <laughs> so well yeah i'm excited to be on man i appreciate it appreciate the invite so uh for those who haven't heard of adam um if you don't mind giving a little bit of your background. So those somehow unfamiliar with you will be familiar. Uh, yeah. Like um, how, how much you want, you want kind of the abbreviated version, I guess. Uh, Yeah. You've, you've given it other places. So, um, right. Yeah. So, so I'm Adam, I'm, I'm married. I live in Oklahoma. I'm uh, married with eight children right now. And, uh, I'm currently working as a, a licensed professional counselor here. Um, I've been doing this for, I don't know how many years now, probably six or seven years, uh, in, in my current capacity. And prior to that was a, uh, juvenile probation officer for the state of Oklahoma for like six years. And then, uh, worked in a juvenile detention facility before that, as I was finishing up my undergrad at, uh, BYU, Idaho in, in Rexburg, Idaho there. Uh, prior to that served a mission. And before that raised a lot of hell, uh, otherwise it was running around kind of living life and snapped out of it and came to my senses and decided that there was probably a God and I should find out about him and uh, went on a mission and here I am. So, um, and I, I do a lot of, uh, do a lot of work in just kind of like general counseling, but, uh, have a deep interest in personality theories um, things like that. And it had, something about them have just always been really interesting to me, especially as I've been introduced to actual theories. Uh, they, they've been fun to kind of explore, to see what works, you know, keep what works, throw out what doesn't. Uh, Cause you know, there's a lot of garbage out there too, but uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell, kind of the quick and dirty version. That's really interesting. Um, my, uh, I recently just did the sociology class for personality development, which is kind of how, what inspired today's episode and kind of got me down this rabbit hole as well. And uh, my instructor, she was also kind of uh, living free when she was younger. And um, I've noticed that a lot of even the important individuals within sociology themselves, when they were yeah. younger, we're party animals. So I think there's something to that. Um, now there are some introverts that just stay away and, you know, sure. just kind of read the books, but it's just interesting where one day they just have a realization like, Oh, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'd, I'd be interested to see like the kinds of people who have those experiences and sort of like clue in and turn around versus the ones that are just uh, more invested in it theoretically, I guess. Like, I wonder if the difference is theory versus application. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, that would be a, an interesting thing to kind of look at. Yeah, we can all blame Freud. <laughs> now, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a uh, I'm a little bit of a Freud apologist. So uh, I, I he catches a lot of crap. I think that's just fashionable to do. I he uh, I think he got some things right. So I. 
I may push back a little bit if, if <laughs> there's a lot of Freud bashing. Not that he doesn't have faults, and certainly there are some things that we certainly, you know, <laughs> raise our eyebrow at when we when we read Freud. But a lot of the things he was onto were really pretty interesting uh, and pretty relevant, especially when you get in like defense mechanisms and stuff like that. But I know we're not here to talk about Freud, but I could. <laughs> uh, I think I think he's an important individual. Uh... I remember watching a documentary on TV back in the day when they actually used to show that on certain channels where they actually would show the basis of the channel, not just some random <laughs> red, um, stuff. And it was a Freud bash. And yeah. for the longest time, I just, I accepted their authority as they wouldn't misguide me. And they were basically saying Freud had done these things, but he was a really terrible person because people turned around and used his stuff and then they were talking about how a lot of people then saw those that had Down syndrome or other um, mental illnesses as uh, byproducts of their parents' failures and adaptations and sexual right. things. And so that if we just torture somebody enough that maybe they'll be fixed and that that led to a lot of people with those conditions being tortured for those reasons. Um, and I've not really been able to dig into it and see any literature that, that backs that. I've, I've seen the opposite right. of it. So um, I think there is a good segment that Freud bashes, you know. Yeah, it, it was kind of interesting going through school. So so I actually graduated with an undergrad in, in sociology, uh, but I went in as a psych major and then got my master's in psychology. But uh, the, it, every psychology course you took that even like touched on Freud, it was like the professor would make some sort of a a disclaimer or something about what you were going to talk about. And there was just a lot of efforts to kind of bash on Freud. And that never really made sense to me because on, in the same breath, he's credited as like, you know, the grandfather of all of this stuff of modern psychology, but he's awful. He's terrible. We don't want to spend much time on it. Well, then, then why even talk about him at all if he has nothing to offer? Um, but they just use it as like, well, this just indicates that we're thinking in this direction at this point in time. And I, I, I don't understand it. I don't, I don't follow it. Um, I've read a lot of Freud. I've looked into a lot of kind of the earlier things that were going on. And about the only thing I could piece together is initially he was uh, discovering with these women that he was interviewing who he later accused of having electric complexes and they want to sleep with their fathers and whatever. But the original kind of discoveries that he was making was that, you no, know, they're actually sleeping with their fathers, like they're actually being sexually abused. And that's a pretty interesting position to find yourself in, to have to report back to high society that you know their tea, right? Like, you know what they're up to. And, and at one point he was threatened with ruin to you're not publishing that and so yeah what do you i mean what do you do like oh so it must be must just be a fantasy thing or whatever so i don't know i it's it's all kind of shrouded in in mystery it's all sort of buried and lost to history so i, I don't know that we'll ever actually know what happened um or how it all went down but like i said he's got some things that are valuable if you can get over the fact that it came from freud a, bro a broken clock is right two times out of the day right so yep so yeah um i think he was just a really interesting man you know sociology theory there's so many different people it's like at this mm -hmm. point you don't even need to you can just be a freudian not agree with what he says but find value in what he did do sure so and if you think back um removing that stupid mod modernity paradigm that we love to look at things with mm -hmm. he was ahead of his time and he just kind of was stirring up the society that was like super prim and proper and um what he's saying nobody should be saying you know bedroom is under a sheet in a dark closet you don't talk right. about it and he's talking about hey maybe there's something something to this you know what happens right. to the child that doesn't get breastfed uh so right uh and in preparation for this, I was kind of going through my notes for young, all poor ethnic. And uh, I remember my book did have some clauses or like uh, labels for like, uh, this guy is problematic because of these reasons. <laughs> and um, right. I, well, according to us name? today, yeah. 
one of them oh what's his name he was a eugenicist he was really big in the eugenicist community oh, i don't know i don't They're know like know. that would have been it's like that um soma typing yeah this has been debunked well actually it's not it's still valid the guy was just a racist so <laughs> um that's real interesting i wonder what our labels are going to be in textbooks you know 50 60 years from now yeah i i don't even <laughs> want to think about it right like i mean almost almost in five or six years later people are finding their their careers completely <laughs> upended because they tweeted something you know yeah twitter's shown that what's happening uh -huh. right and we're just like not very far down the road uh who was it there was like a there's like a film director or somebody who was like just recently said I wouldn't I wouldn't have made that movie today I wouldn't have, I don't I don't remember what it was so it's pointless to even bring it up but it was because it was uh not the characters were not representative uh -huh. oh it was a, it was the creator of Friends yeah that's what it was right where he was like oh I'm so sorry that <laughs> I didn't have diversity in it and like come on man your your show's talking about white people from New York in a white <laughs> neighborhood so yeah but okay. you can't you can't talk about that anymore you can't say that those things exist right it's, it's gotta everybody's got to be represented everybody has to have a seat at the table hey here's an idea for them everyone loves reboots nowadays because there's no originality <laughs> in um, hollywood anymore so why don't you do friends in harlem or the bronx or something different you know like, you do it online call it mutuals it. Yeah. <laughs> oh man yeah, uh, Freud would get canceled so fast if he had a Twitter today. <laughs> oh, for sure. Um, I think me and a family member, we always, uh, Freudian slip, I think that's what he's most famous for, that people mm -hmm. who have no idea of who he is, but understand that there's things that we just slip. And he, he was more focused on the sexual nature, but uh, I'm right. more that, focused, that yeah that your subconscious betrays you right like and so you have kind of the, the Freudian slip and that's where he sort of had this idea that there's a collective unconscious and that's where Carl Jung comes into play and uh, they were really good friends for a bit and then they had a huge falling out and that's where we have Freudians and Jungians and um I and tend Adleri to Adlerians are kind of yeah. in there too right so it's like it's like the DM group that fell apart. <laughs> <laughs> Terribly accurate. Um, I'm, I tend to be more of a Jungian. I, I kind of feel like he had a lot of those ideas and that his early life stage development wasn't so as concrete. Because to Freud, it seemed like from the moment you're born and a little bit before to about puberty, that's it. That's all the personality formation that you got. Right. That all, that's all going to occur there. Um, what about teenage life? Like that's terrible, like through high school right. and then early adult career. And then like having children changes some people. Like I know people that were just absolute monsters. And the second they had a kid, they've like turned around. Right. And I've seen that in the military where I'm like, you've done some crazy stuff on the weekend, sir, and you are an angel right now. So <laughs> um, there's a lot to be said about personality development when, when it occurs. What's, what's your take on that? On just personality development in general? Um, earlier or later formative? Or yeah. Total life. So, oh uh, man. So <laughs> we're going to start getting into kind of all the little bits and pieces here. So, so generally as kind of like a bird's eye view, I'm, I'm very much like an Erickson uh, kind of stages of development. Like I, I think those are individual stages. Um, I'm not 100% on kind of his take on how you have to like navigate each, each stage appropriately to then kind of progress without the dysfunction of the next stage. Um, and if you don't, then you have kind of these hangups and sort of have to work backwards to figure out those hangups. Like, I mean, that's all well and good. But but I, I, I do kind of generally trust those stages. One of the things that I say to people, though, uh, clients and friends and everybody, is that everything that like majorly screws us up typically happens in the first eight to 10 years of our lives. And, and I have 
some basis for that. Uh, part of that is kind of those, those early things. Now, that's not to say that you can't have trauma later in your life that totally screws you up, right? Like, I mean, we, we experience lots of things. But in those formative years, uh, your, your prefrontal cortex is not online. It's not available to process situations that you find yourself in or to navigate uh, you know, experiences that you're having and to give yourself any sort of rationalization for why they're happening. We're, we're pretty much 100% emotional at that, at that stage, right? That phase of life. And the, the reason I say this is because during that phase, you have no frame of reference for how the world works whatsoever. Everything you learn from, from your parents and from your environment, you just accept as true. And you adjust your worldview to allow those things to be true, to be the standard. And unfortunately, as we all, we all grow up in imperfect homes, being raised by imperfect people. And so they tell us things that are skewed, that are off, that are wrong, that are false, but we don't know that at the time. As kids, we just say, okay, this is how the world works. And we make assumptions based on that input. So for example, you get in trouble, dad comes in, whips you with a belt, says this hurts me more than it hurts you, right? Um, the child doesn't understand that. It sucks, it hurts, this isn't any fun, but is forced to kind of internalize that message and make that message true. So the only way that message is true is if I'm a bad kid, if I deserve to be punished, if we hurt those we love, yada, yada, yada. And so in the first, like I said, eight to 10 years of your life, you are constantly making those kinds of, of mental connections. So uh, input is happening, right? You're, you're experiencing your environment and you're framing it in a way to make the people in your life perfect and you become kind of imperfect. Then as you enter kind of the school age and adolescence and young adulthood, prefrontal cortex is coming online and you start having experiences that are contrary to that. Um, and you start to struggle with kind of these emotional beliefs that now they're in contrast with, with your rational beliefs and your, your lived experiences. And we start running into kind of these, you know, this is why teenagers act out. This is why people throw off kind of their old life in, and, and go kind of wild for a while. Um, and, and I'm not totally on board with saying this, but it's a thought that's been mulling around in my head. Like, I wonder to what degree our teenage rebellion, like if there's some sort of a correlation, like the intensity with which we rebel is an indicator of kind of the, uh, how far off our emotional beliefs are about certain things. Right. So, so the more kind of traumatic, the more turmoil in sort of a, a childhood, I, I don't know for sure. I'm not throwing that out there as gospel or anything, but it's just been really interesting to me. So um, that that's kind of my view generally on sort of like personality development over time, because all of these things impact personality. I also don't think personality can be like defined as easily as some people like to do it. Um, like we know what personality is. We know when we interact with people, we get kind of a sense of their personality, but I think it's just way, there's, there's way more going into it than can be like easily quantified. Right. Um, but I'm very much in temperament, which is sort of like a baseline, like I, I described as operating systems for people and your experiences are viewed through the lens of inherent temperaments. Uh, no two people are going to have the same experiences. Everybody's going to have different things happen to them. And so no two people wind up at the same place. No two people have the same personalities. It's not as clean as all that. I, ho I hope some of that makes sense. It, it, it does. And to support what you're saying, um, I find it really interesting that one of the big segments of personality development is looking at twins because that is like yeah, scientific... Yeah as homogenous as you can get, um, especially if they're congenital Siamese twins, non-conjoined, uh, they're literally the same body. Right. Monozygotic, right. right? Came from the same yes. head. Yeah. Um, now heaven forbid they have a parent that wants them to dress and look like each other. <laughs> that doesn't have anything to do with destroying their personality and giving them complexes. But, um, it's just interesting to see how they form. Um, 
different well, personalities. Because a lot, because yeah, because a lot of these studies show that yeah, they they turn out very differently. Mm-hmm. I, I think I think the the prevalence of well, maybe we won't get into that. Um, there was one study I looked at that was looking at like personality traits or something. I found something only like 13% of, of monozygotic twins shared all the same personality traits, like what we would look for in kind of the big five and these other things. Mm. Like it was just, it, it was, there was no correlation at all to it. Um, which is kind of interesting because you could argue monozygotic twins, like biologically are exactly the same, right? Like genetically, they're the same. They're growing up. They're often not found separate from each other. So they're having all of the same experiences. They're living in the same environment. They're attending the same schools, the same classes, and still become so divergent in their personalities. It's it's kind of fascinating. It's really interesting when they find out how they can act and imitate the mannerisms (laughs) of the other one. I remember reading a book about um a navy seal who went through and nobody knew um until after the fact but during hell week they didn't know this guy had a twin and his twin snuck him out and they swapped for a day (laughs) so this was like back in the 90s you know a different time but that's just insane that they nobody noticed because he was imitating him so well and you know, well, and during it, something like Hell Week, like I mean, who who's got the energy to notice? Oh yeah, <laughs> um, I'm sure they screen for you if you have twins now. But uh, <laughs> right, um, it's real interesting. Yeah, I my pet peeve is when I see parents dressing twins in the same clothes. I'm like, really? <laughs> Come on, that, that's more of a you statement than their statement, right? I guarantee that they're different. Um, I'm really obsessed with uh, the genetic abnormalities of conjoined life twins and how separate of people they are. Um, There's uh, there's there's a couple I forget their names, um, but they're basically my same age. They got famous on TLC. Mm -hmm. Um, They're now they're now um, high school teachers, I think. And while they literally did everything together, they're complete because they can't, they can't just walk away. They're right. stuck to the hips and they have different strengths. One's good at math. One's not one can remember facts really well. The other one has no facts collection. One, you know, one remembers, Hey, we have to be here in five minutes. And the other one is in la la land. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's really interesting, which just shows like the, each brain is going to go a different direction. Like you said that right. our environment, that's something I really um, kind of became biased towards. I really think environment plays into the effect. Maybe there is something in our brain that as soon as we're born just clicks and it drives our personality down a certain track, but there's so much environment stuff happening that I just, I don't think that maybe, um, for those who we kind of gotten down a rabbit hole, um, there, there's an idea that maybe there's a collective unconsciousness that predefines your personality. Um, that's what kind of like Freud talks about with his early life stages. Carl Jung, if um, archetype, uh, you guys recently had um, the, oh, what's his name from the exit podcast on recently? Bennett. Bennett. That was amazing, by the way. Um, I always kind of mix Young and Briggs and Myers, but um, Young and Briggs and Myers, they're Jungian theories. And so right. it's real interesting. Yeah, I, I, I've i always been kind of agnostic towards the collective unconscious, uh, except that every time I hear the Scottish pipes and drums, like I cry and I can't help it. And so like you, you could argue that, you know, if you're if you're a collective unconscious believer that like that was important to my uh, to my ancestors and that gets passed down like that, that changes you genetically and it gets passed down through whenever, uh, the collective unconscious is a little more ethereal than like just mm-hmm. simple genetics, but, um, that, yeah, that you inherit like the, the goals, hopes, dreams, and fears of your ancestors as well. It's not just simple, you know, uh, phenotype or whatever, how you look, but what you believe in kind of what you're prone to which is 
I don't know, sort of interesting from like a, like a gospel perspective when we're told that, you know, God will visit his wrath upon the, you know, second, third generation from people who apostatize or, or whatever. So maybe there, maybe there is something to that, but I haven't done a lot of deep diving. Uh, there's a book, I think I have it on my shelf called the invisible web that I think touches on a bunch of this, but mm-hmm. I haven't, I haven't read it yet. So I don't know what, uh, if that's even what the book's about. I think that's what it's about, but I just haven't gotten around to reading it. Yeah, I have a rule. I don't really stick to it really well. Um, it, it, it comes from like D&D modeling and Warhammer stuff, but you don't buy a new figure until you paint the last one. And um, I don't <laughs> buy a new book until I read the last one. It does. So far, I get like two books ahead. Um, so I understand having a bookshelf of books you haven't read yet. So <laughs> right. my grandpa would smack me if he... Uh, heard me talking about haven't read the book what do you mean you haven't read the book you got time to read the book <laughs> <laughs> no and and this is where so I, I i don't know how into kind of jung and, and mbti and stuff you want to get but um because you're talking about something like yeah there so so the way the the theories that i enjoy and the ones that i kind of promote through uh the website and and just personally uh is arguably union based um it's myers briggs kind of came after jung they took the work of jung and basically codified it uh they they made it relevant and measurable jung just kind of spewed it all over pages and there it was and then they went in and sort of like deciphered it and broke it down in a way um that was that was observable and they started like observing the traits that he's he's talking about and like i said just kind of codified it created uh, a, an instrument that they could assess people and then plug them into kind of the union scales of the personality trait scales um where where i got i got introduced to the work of a guy named david kiersey uh when i was on my mission and uh, I, I was speaking with somebody and kind of expressing some interest in psychology. So they gave me this book that he'd written back in like 97. My my mission was 2001. I think this was like 2002 or 2003 uh, when I was introduced to it. And it was kind of a trip to read it and to, you know, take the test that he has there, a little temperament sorter, like every other MBTI, whatever. Um, And then to read what David Kiersey had sort of observed about my type. And to have it like, like totally resonate as he's breaking me down, this guy who, you know, several years earlier is writing about me and telling me things that I'd never even considered in myself until I hear them out loud. And it's like, oh, crap, like, this is real. This is, how does this guy know this? And and so it just like lit sort of a fire in me. But that was my, that was my jump in to kind of like real, like looks like close look at theory was with David Kiersey. David Kiersey had departed from Myers-Briggs. He, he very much liked Jung, but he thought that uh, Isabel Myers made a huge mistake in the way that she type grouped. So, so MBTI has what are called function pairs, um, where, where certain, uh, certain traits are paired together and they create kind of this, this, this temperament type, right? Um, and so you have intuitive thinking, uh, which would be the N and the T in the in the Myers letters, right? Uh, intuitive thinking, intuitive feeling, and then she groups, you know, uh, sensing, thinking, sensing, feeling, the S S T S F, and so the functional pairs in Myers Briggs are N T uh, N F S T S F, and Kirji had the benefit of working in school systems and everything else, and he was trying to apply this theory, the MBTI theory, and it just didn't work. Uh, what he was observing wasn't quite right. And so he went back and looked at what Myers did and looked at what Jung was saying. And he he tweaked the function pairs basically uh, in a way that just makes total sense. And then he, he called them temperament types and gave them all names, but the function pairing is different. So in MBTI, the NT and the F or NF are still the same, but he took ST and made it SP and took SF and made it SJ. And those are the those are the function pairings that kind of matter. That's kind of the, the concrete box for temperament types. Um, and so that's that's where I jumped in, and that's what I have just found super fascinating, really easy to wrap my head around. Uh, MBTI is too expansive for me. It doesn't uh, mm-hmm. 
there's there's just too much and it's not it's not practical uh i like it i like it quick and dirty like uh, a theory has to have utility for me to really give a crap about it i can't i i don't enjoy theory for the sake of theory i enjoy theory for what it what tools does it give me for dealing with people and dealing with situations and kind of dealing with myself and i found that in kirzy's theory now with kirzy and arguably with mbti uh your type is set and we don't know the mechanism by which type is is created or generated i've just always held that it's just sort of the way the brain unfolds right um and one of the the analogies that i sort of give for people to in explaining this is it's well i'll pause that for a second I will, <laughs> I will geek out on this for hours. So you're going to have to just like jump Same. in and interrupt me. <laughs> um, uh, we'll provide links for those who are lost in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> right. But yeah. So, so where does it come from? I, I don't know. Um, we don't know. It's just, it's just the way the, the brain unfolds and it's, it's the operating system that you get flashed with is kind of this temperament type. And it just provides a bedrock, sort of the foundation and the lens through which you will experience the rest of the world. And there's a, there's a lot of historical um, evidence of, of people kind of generally fitting these types, like it, it goes way back. Um, and so like people like Jung aren't just making it up out of thin air, right? Like this is based in a lot of observations over a lot of years. Um, Plato had observations about this, you know, Socrates had observations about this. So anyway, I'll, I'll take a breath there and let you say what. <laughs> so um, for those who don't know, Carl Jung kind of had these um, arch typologies and I'd highly recommend checking out um, uh, Adam's uh, Spiritual Arson podcast about the typology with, uh, oh, I'm sorry, what's still groggy. Um, what was his name again? Which, which one? You just had him on recently about the typology. Uh, so on, on the spiritual arson, um, we had Bennett on talking about Bennett, yeah, exit, but he has had, so on the exit podcast, there has been a guy named, uh, Scott Fishbush, oh. who's like, like hardcore Scott. union dude. Yeah. And, and Scott breaks it down in, in ways that, that I just simply can't, um, he's, he's deep in kind of union. Yeah. So that may be the podcast that, uh, so I want to refer people who want to know about that, what our typology is to jump back to Jung. Um, I, he, he said something though, um, in that episode, and you, you just said something too, that a lot of the pervading theory is that once you have your type, you stay mm -hmm. that type. Right. And, uh, my, I am a researcher's worst nightmare. I like taking <laughs> quizzes, um, and surveys. I don't, it doesn't yeah. bother me. Um, I get benefit from it. So, uh, I've taken these before. I've taken Jung's arc typology um, type uh, typing. Uh, I go back and forth between explorer and magician. Okay. I balance between those, which to a Jungian, I should not. Right. So, so that's, yeah. that's where they're, they're kind of like, no, that, that doesn't happen. You or, can't or do that. Together. Stop. <laughs> that doesn't. And well, then the Briggs Myers are going to be very upset because uh, for this class, we actually had to take uh, the 16 personalities. Um, mm -hmm. And so we needed the Briggs Myers. And I'm like, I know I'm an INTJ. And my instructor was like, just go ahead and take it again. And I was like, oh, come on. So I log back into 16 personalities. I'm like, I want to do a new quiz. I get E in E in uh, F J T. So I had completely moved on the right. spectrum <clears throat> and I was like, wait, what, how do you mean? I, what do you mean? I learned. Uh, so this is where I have a lot of pre bias towards environmental factors and what situations you're put in can change your personality. Right. Um, so I've basically went from an introvert to learn extroversion and it's become a part of me and i went from thinking only to now i kind of do a lot more feeling than thinking 
Right. And, and so this is one of those things. Um, and, and I wrote about this on, on my Substack that, uh, because n- none of these tests <laughs> are there, none of them are written equally, right? Like, yeah. uh, so much bias is introduced into these, these sorters because of who's writing them. Mm-hmm. And so they'll kind of favor certain things and you, you can hear, at least I can, when I read some of these tests, you can hear that they're asking, uh, they're trying to separate out certain types based on what they believe those types should answer. And, and so they're just, they're garbage. Um, and self-report tests are, are kind of difficult anyway yeah. without internal kind of checks and balances. So like, you know, the MMPI is a pretty interesting test because there's like 500 questions, but there's that many questions because they're also looking for how truthful you're being in the mm-hmm. questions based on other questions. And, you know, it, it's kind of, it's kind of expansive, but MBTI has always had these problems with it is, is, you know, it, it, Myers was a, she was a lay person. She, she wasn't a professional. This was yeah. just something she got super interested in and started doing. And like the quizzes and stuff she was giving were to friends and family and her students. Uh, that's, and it got super popular and, and she shared it with Carl Jung and he was like, okay, cool. You know, I guess whatever. Um, but yeah, so none of these, none of these questions are, none of these tests are the same and they're not all created equal. And I've seen some really, really terrible ones. Uh, so, so where I like Kiersey and kind of this temperament model is because what he says is like the E and the I don't really matter. Like they do flux, they do change. And that is kind of environmental in, in some ways, right? Like, um, but also like you, you can change over time, like your, your perspective changes, but he would argue that the core of you does not change. So he has four types. It's the idealist, the rational artisan and guardian. And those are the four types. So he breaks them down by uh, in kind of this this matrix of language versus uh, environment. And the way that I like to explain this to people is it's like it's like an operating system on your smartphone. Okay, so your your temperament, the type that you are, is is the operating system. It's on there. It's flashed. It works with the hardware, and it and it interfaces with you, the user. Okay, but if you have an iPhone and you have an Android, you can install the Twitter app on your iPhone, and I can install the Twitter app on my Android, and you and I can hold them up side by side and look at them, and based on observations, based on how they function, you would say these are the same app, right? But I can't, with my iPhone, go to Google Play and get the Twitter app. I have to go to Apple. Well, why is that? Well, because it's written for my hardware a little differently. Well, it's written written for my operating system. The hardware is basically the same. In fact, most components are made in the same factory. But the, the operating system is different. And so the, the, the app has to be written a little bit differently. But on the surface, it looks the same. And so all of these like personality typing kinds of questions and, and you go and you read at 16personalities.com or whatever, it's giving you a lot of the way it looks. And it's not giving you hardly any of the why it looks that way. It's just saying, this, this is how it looks. These types of people tend to do this. And so it's really easy to read those descriptions and say, well, I'm a little bit of this and I'm a little bit of that. Well, yeah, because we're all capable of running any app that is written for your operating system. And, and so the, the crossover is, is huge and it, it just muddies the water. And so, so I take a step back and say, okay, what's, what's the operating system? Because if my Twitter app on my iPhone starts to get buggy, I don't want to take it to an Android technician and say, fix it, because he's not going to have a clue as to what to do with it. You take it to somebody who understands that operating system. I don't care how well you understand the app or the algorithm. You need to understand the operating system in order to, to clean up my phone, right? Um, and that, that's, that's pretty much the, the foundation for my approach in therapy. Uh, in, in my counseling practice, in my, you know, consultations with people, like, this is the, the foundation that we're working from is, is understanding the operating system. And then you're going to have a whole bunch of experiences, but they're going to be experienced through that lens. And it depends on which apps you have installed at the time, figuratively, right? And, and how well they're running uh, kind of determines how, how that experience is going to go for you. Does that make sense? And if you use the apps, 
<laughs> right, right. You you may so, be you may be fine with the the default Notepad app, right? And, I, and that's how you stay organized. I kind of like that. Um, like for those who know computers, you have um, people to see, think Microsoft and uh, Apple, but you actually have like Ubuntu mm-hmm. and Linux. So there's right. base operating things, and the way and what you can do and how things are set up are different, which kind of dictates when you install an app or a program, it's gonna it's going to act a little bit different. Um, yeah, exactly. I've had an Apple for a long time and I now use a Samsung and, you know, I kind of miss the emojis you get with Apple or yeah, just some of the stuff that is a little bit different. I, I like the camera quality more on a mm-hmm. Samsung. So, um, but you're still stuck. So if I don't like that, I can't just reflash an Apple. I mean, I could, do a hack but it's not going to work as good as an actual you know apple or samsung or you know whatever your google pie whatever phone analogy so right and and so so i would argue kind of with your test results right so you test as an intj or Mm -hmm. whatever and then you become an enfp whatever it is or however it switches um, I, I would say I, I would take exception to that, right? Because the NT is what makes you the rational, like mm. that's that's its own operating system. The NF is a separate kind of operating system. And so I, I would I would say that's probably not what happened, but you're probably being asked questions about apps, about how you respond in situations, not kind of why like like what you would prefer or sort of why that happens. It, because you're right. Like you you are like, if you have a Linux box, it's a Linux box and yes, you can run all kinds of great stuff. You can still surf the internet. You can still get in there. It's just the setup for that is going to be a little bit differently or work a little different. But if I sat down in front of a Linux box and you had a standard web page pulled up other than like kind of the navigation buttons, like it's not going to look a ton different. And we'll be like, wow, I'm suddenly a Windows machine because all of this, no, well, no, you're not, you're still a Linux, right? Yeah. And we need to understand that because, because there will be bugs, there will be viruses, there, there will be things that come along and, and kind of screw you up. I, I do want to, I don't want to give too much into it because people go down the racism rabbit hole real fast with uh, epigenetics, but there's a lot of new research coming out that actually shows um, where, the, where the parents are will influence the development of the embryo. For instance, um, yeah. they've discovered that people who are obese, um, the male sperm is actually more fatty. And so it's almost like what your physical condition is, is going to pre um, trigger a genetic response from when that sperm finally gets into the egg. It's going to pre-code like, hey, life is great. You know, we don't need to do a lot. We can eat all the food we want and you can see that, you know, two fat parents have a fat kid. It's very rare that you see two fat parents, the skinny kid. Um, so I really think there, there's something into that. Um, I have, see, or if we take it to the aspect of introvert and extrovert, you know, if we take a, a, a jock and a cheerleader wife and they have a child, I don't see that child very being inclined to be an introvert hanging out with the D club after school they're probably going to pick up on those extroverted qualities and have a, a, a charisma a little bit higher so um that's kind of where i personally am kind of going away from the Jungian as well so uh, this makes this conversation really interesting um we can't really talk about it much but uh i kind of want to sidetrack but were you able to dig into my final paper that I said? I, I, I had requested access and I never got it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, uh, uh, I'll make it. Um, for those I, I wanted, I wanted to come okay. kind of prepared with prepared that. Prepared for that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, um, I was denied. So for those who don't know, sometimes when you do a personality class, you have a final. And for my class, my final was uh, you had to create a new personality theory and I didn't want to leave Jungian. Um, it's just so safe there. I like it. And I just was thinking about playing D and D. And so I really feel like in life, we have these different experiences 
and we kind of get pigeonholed, but it doesn't mean we're stuck there. Um, and I introduced something called multi-classing, where if you go through something traumatic enough or you do enough self-help, you can actually change where you are and be something different. Um, basically, in your analogy, for those that like the, the cell phone, you have an Apple, but you're downloading Android programs. Yeah. Or Samsung, and you're doing Apple stuff. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll shoot that over to you. Sadly, I can't release it because it's now forever property of my school I go to. So, <laughs> that, that bothers me so much. Yeah, that's, that's kind of odd. I've actually. written some really great papers and it's like, this is ours forever. <laughs> um, this means you have to keep being original. So All right. yeah, I really like that. And um, oh, what, what's his name? He was noticing that, hey, this isn't working uh, with my students. I really feel like teenage years are really the biggest cementers of how you can turn out. Yeah. Um, all, you know, so, so I'm, I'm way less of like a, like a determinist, right? Like okay. I, I, I'm very much in the camp of like, who knows? I mean, you meet people and you can kind of tell like, okay, <laughs> this is, this is kind of all you're ever going to be capable of. Um, but, but maybe this is just kind of like where, where I come from all of this, like spiritually, uh, that, that there's, there's potential in all of us to defy every card that may be stacked against us. Um, and, and you see it, you have a lot of these breakouts and you can argue that, yes, they are the exception and not, not the rule and that the rule or the exception doesn't make the rule. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to be more of like everybody can change and part of this is my own experience in, in my teenage years you know I was kind of I was kind of a twit and uh was was super self-indulgent and self-destructive and you know a drug addict and all kinds of stuff and it was a it was a spiritual turning point for me and it changed everything it didn't change my baseline personality it didn't change my temperament it did change my personality it didn't change my temperament um but it it provided me new information and those experiences did. And it changed my mind about certain things. It gave me a new perspective, which then influenced my behavior after that. Um, and so I, I think, I think we're probably too quick to count people out. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not willing to just give everybody a blank check, right? Like, Oh, you're, you're all going to turn out just wonderful and we don't have to do anything about it. Um, so yeah, I, I just, I'm, I'm just, in a little different place, I think, on that one. Yeah, for those who don't know, um, in sociology, you have this um, free will and determinism. So free will is, or free agency for those who want to use that terminology is basically individual can choose to do whatever they want, whenever they want. There's, they, they can do that. It's going to require some work or a lot of work, uh, and they can change how and where they are. Uh, determinism is basically there's hardwired um, reproductive qualities that basically, you know, flight, flight response. Um, and we're just kind of stuck in those, those things. And so in sociology you often hear, you know, free will of first determinism, determinist right. free will is so just so those, um, I'm kind of a mix. I really think that there is some pre-program, um, yeah. like you're talking about your software, we want to do it this way. Um, but we have a lot of leeway in how, how that operates. Um, I feel like my problem is I come more from studying theology and other sciences. So I'm kind of really biased towards kind of what can be quantified, right? Like the sort of yeah. the hard, the hard sciences and yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's interesting that you find yourself in this field, right? Like kind of with that mindset. Um, cause I, I think what I love about this field is that there, there, there aren't any hard and fast rules. Like I get to tear off in one direction until it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> I do what I and want. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like we're all just making crap up and, and I'm grateful to people like you who can, who can do the research and be like, well, actually, so here's some, here's some data sort of supporting what you're saying or debunking what you're saying. I saw, uh, I saw a, a tweet about sociology and it was like, if you want to make a name for yourself, you definitely can. 
Yeah, you and can. I was like, you come that's up with a any... low blow, but yes, it's, <laughs> it's true. Uh, come up with whatever you want. Yeah. Uh, personality theorists. There's, it's like a dime a dozen. Yeah. And and there's some dumb ones. I, like, I, I've become such a personality theory snob. Like, I, I totally recognize that. I hear some of these theories. I'm like, that's stupid. I don't even, I'm not even going to like don't look at it. And, and I'm way more dismissive than I should be. Mm. But but I do find myself there often saying that's a, that's a really screwy idea and that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It's just, it's just so in, that's why I think these topics, that's why I'm, you know, I take tests of like which Batman character I am, you know, mm-hmm. just, I find, right. I find it interesting. And, and what you said is true. Um, in science, you have a predisposed bias mm-hmm. of um, we're looking for this. And so when they design those tests, that bias can influence the results and outcome and how it's perceived. So even though the researcher, bless their heart, is doing everything that they can to be unbiased, we still have lenses that we look at the world. So um, yeah. it does make sense. Somebody would come along and be like, hey, this this kind of, it's nice, but it doesn't really work when you take yeah. it out in the real world. Well, and, and that's, that, that's what you need is you need people applying it to the field. Right. And so, so David Kirsey, who had referenced earlier, um, he worked in the school system and he worked with like troubled youth and like delinquent youth. And so a lot of his theory is kind of like crafted in that environment where he has regular sort of subjects. He didn't have the benefit of being a licensed therapist. Mm. And so, so as <clears throat> I've become a therapist, like I've brought that theory into this kind of setting. Um, and that's been really interesting because I'm, I'm able to look at sort of like the dysfunctional side of things, like where things break down. And, and what I'm just dis- discovering, maybe I'm discovering it, maybe it's been known all along, but there are certain conditions that, that plague some types more than other types, right? So certain operating systems are prone mm-hmm. to certain breakdowns uh, in, in ways that maybe look similar and are just as frustrating as every other operating system. But, but are unique to that operating system. Um, you know, w- Windows gets a virus just by getting on the internet. It's just, it's just all there, right? <laughs> but, but Linux has other issues that can go wrong and you need to be able to kind of understand that. So what I've been able to do in practice is just, because I, I mean, I interview people all day, like, mm. like dozens of people a week, all day for years. And I'm bringing this lens to kind of our discussions and talking about symptoms and whatever. And so there are certain things, certain conditions that track with certain temperaments or operating systems. Um, and there are consistently um, preferences found in these operating systems that when not met and certain needs that when not met present in certain kind of negative ways. It's very I don't, I don't think that was an answer to any question no, you asked. No. I'm just kind of rambling. It just adds that. Um, something I do notice that there's a lot of bias, um, for disregarding, uh, theism in, in this personality theories. And that's kind of what I wanted to kind of more focus on is could there be, if, you know, we talked beforehand with the church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints have a personality test with the with the Jews, Catholics, Muslims, Protestants, Hindus, what, if they had one, what would it be? Um, and that's just something I saw that a lot of these things, you know, maybe your adaptations through your environmental experiences and as you emotionally mm-hmm. process kind of will steer you towards being more inclined or less inclined to being religious or, or right. non-religious. Um, so, so I, I'm glad you bring this up because um, in, in the way that I use temperament theory, uh, and this is one of the things that I've kind of developed mostly independent of Kirsey, based on Kirsey's work, but at this point in the game, man, like it, it's kind of my own beast now. But one of the things that Kirsey gives us is, is this model, that, uh, this model of self-image that's comprised of three components. It's self-esteem, self-respect, and self-confidence. And, and those three things, as, as Kirsey defines them, together create a healthy self-image. And where, where I've taken his work and kind of expanded it 
is uh, there's a couple of assumptions that I have to make, which you, you make in all theory, right? It starts with kind of an assumption and then you just fit it into every situation and see how it works. Um, but one of the assumptions is that we have kind of a prime psychological directive to maintain a positive self-image at all times, right? And, and so I, I describe this on, on the website and with people as like a three-legged stool. And each of those three legs, if they are firmly planted on the ground, that seat is a positive self-image. And when you take a seat on it, there's no wobble, there's no uncertainty. And so 100% of your energy gets spent externally, right? Like you get to enjoy yourself, you get to enjoy your company, you get to sit at the bar, you get to enjoy the music, whatever's going on around you. But if I introduce a wobble into that leg, in one leg of your stool, then suddenly how much of your energy gets diverted downwards to maintaining a balance? And, and this is what happens with, with us. If we take a shot to the self-esteem, take a shot to the self-respect or the self-confidence, uh, we introduce a you know, something a little alarming, a little worrisome about maintaining that self-image. Suddenly that's in question. But the self, self-esteem component has to do with our relationship with other people. It's the way that others see us and the feedback that we get from others is how we kind of determine where we're at in that relationship. The feedback from self kind of determines self-confidence. Do you think you're a loser? Do you think you can't do this? Do you, do you anticipate that you're going to fail at this thing? Then that introduces kind of an element of anxiety. It's the absence of self-confidence. The self-respect one is the one that has to do with relationship to God or to higher power. And, and I write about this on, on the blog, like, I don't care who you are, all of us have some higher authority, some higher power, unless you're a sociopath, you are deferring in some way or another to something bigger than you. That might be God, that might be society, that might be the state, that might be the idealism of a utopia, whatever it is, you're diverting to some greater cause than you. And the strength of your commitment and relationship to that greater cause is the source of your self-respect. And it is as much uh, a, a part of you and, and is as necessary to maintain a healthy sense of self-respect as it is for self-esteem and self-confidence. Because without, without it, you introduce a wobble to your stool. Your self-image is incomplete. Does that make sense? It, yeah, I'm tracking. Um... Yeah, so, so, so basically kind of in summation to boil it down, there are three relationships that matter relationship to God, to self, and to others. And so much of your mental and emotional and spiritual health is determined by, by those relationships, however you reconcile them. So nobody is without a God. We just, we just we all prioritize God. Yeah, we all have one. We just look at him differently. Um, I, I stole this, the, my definition of spiritual that I use as spiritual danger clothes. Um, I, I'm stealing this from a chaplain and I hope to have him on here um, soon, but uh, his idea is spiritual is whatever gets you out of the bed driving. A lot of people assume spirituality is, is, is faith, but it, it, it can be, you know, maybe it's your family. Um, Cause there's a lot of spiritual people who are not religious and people just yeah. don't understand that that's impossible. Um, actually it is. So I kind of think that to discuss your stool analogy um, in terms of like Dungeons and Dragons, you have um, six base stats, you have will and charisma. I kind of see will is more complex than just will. You're, you're right. either, you have it or you don't. I think it's, it goes to um, a survivalist to a spiritual drive. So is your right. will focused on pure survival? Like I'm going to get through this terrible situation to live another day. Or is it, if I don't get out of this burning house right now, my children will die, the spiritual right. driver. And then under that, I think there is a atheist to theist um, spectrum as well. You know, are you inclined to feel that you're, are you a nihilist or do you believe that there is a high, an actual higher power? Um, so that's kind of where I fall on that, but I like your stool analogy and you, I can kind of reflect and see that in my life where I've gone and I can see that in others. Yeah. Um, it's almost like the persona with a uh, Jungian and how, how he can operate and what we show the world. 
to what really happens when the world is we're left alone. Right. I'm, I'm sorry, folks. My cats are doing craziness right now. They're a bunch <laughs> of monsters. Savages. They're all, over, all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, too many videos I've done, and they're just in the background, just beating each other up. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's what they're good for (laughs) yeah um but yeah that's stool analogy um now you said you have eight children Mm -hmm. i'm curious has that influenced your mechanics of personality as well as your work with your clients i'm thinking you're maybe seeing um a little bit something to how they're developing because there are from what i understand uh you need a uh, infant to preteen or teenage years at this point so you have a good yeah. age range yeah our, our oldest will be 15 in like a couple weeks and then our youngest is like four months old so and and everything in between so yeah it's uh you know and and, and this is Pro- probably why I'm kind of uh, with Erickson on stages of development because you see it right like I, I've, I've seen that play out over the last 15 years um, kind of these stages uh, I'm also seeing kind of from the get-go totally different personalities and and so it, it to me it just kind of reinforces this idea of temperament operating systems like you come into the world flashed with an operating system like it's it's locked in, it's there. Um, because the way they develop is different. Like the things that they sort of gravitate towards and, and the way that they track in their development is similar for, for similar temperament types and then dissimilar from the other types. Um, and so that's been really kind of cool uh, to sort of watch. And my wife is really into this too. Like we, we've had lots of conversations. In fact, when we were dating, I laid one of these tests on her and said, you need to understand the differences between us if this is going to work, because I'm worried that with her type that she would be super disappointed to find out that I'm not some deep thinker, you know, poetic type or whatever. Mm. She's, she's expecting this kind of like dark romantic, you're not going to get that with me. Like, so yeah. let's, go, let's go ahead and <laughs> sorry, destroy, skip that class, <laughs> destroy those illusions first. Right. And, and let's move right into this, but so, so she's, it's been nice to have her as a kind of a partner making some of the same observations that I'm making and, and different observations, different insight, because she's a different, you know, temperament type than me. Um, and so she, she's looking at things through a different lens. Uh, and so that's been really helpful. But yeah, if anything, having kids has just, I'm, I'm more reinforced in a lot of the things I believe because I'm constantly seeing, seeing it like it. play out. And one, one of my beefs with like personality theories and stuff is like, it's, it's nice to know it's really interesting, but it never really gets over the threshold of like retroactively uh, just kind of providing explanation to being able to actually predict and, and Outcomes. shape behaviors. Yeah. Like you don't, you don't see that very often. Um but, but I, I do see with a lot of the things that I've kind of adopted, like I can predict some behaviors and I can kind of like account for them. And it's, it, that's difficult to, to, to measure because like, how do you measure prevention? You know what I mean? Um, you can't really say, it, it's like a politician when he says, we saved 30 million jobs. So you don't, you don't really, you can't, you don't know that. <laughs> like, there's no way to know that unless employers were telling you that they planned on dropping this many jobs it just doesn't work that way so so there are some some problems with it but like i said we have been able to anticipate behaviors and we have been able to anticipate reactions to certain situations and how they're going to take them and have been able to front load uh things to sort of soften that for for our kids and and for our friends and stuff so um it's clearly obvious that I'm really into the nerdy stuff uh so <laughs> i started playing dungeons and dragons which to my mom's best wishes was absolutely against because it was satanic and uh-huh. you know obviously i needed to do it at that point right she said don't do it and all my brain could think was do it do it <laughs> yep um and as i've 
played that game for so many years and all the different things i've i've been more inclined to play as a dungeon master which basically i create the setting um i can mm-hmm. use the book and and run and basically make sure everyone's in line and i will tell a pre-made story or construct a story um and i've had several friend groups and different groups and just random people i've played with we are really predisposed um to a class or a personality and so i if i've played with you before and i've seen what type type of classes you've played with you're more likely going to be playing with that class if we start a new campaign a new story um like i go back and forth between the rogue and sorcerer i just you know i've played all the classes i just i like those i like those characters right Um, and i feel like in retrospect i can look on that and see um, if I play a game, I'm very likely to play one of those two. And if I've seen people I've played with and I've associated with, I'm very inclined to know, Hey, you're very likely going to be choosing this in the future, but the exact nuance and how you respond is going to be different. Um, not to say that people just can't be sporadic and play something different every single time. Um, but still technically that is something that they're doing. They're predisposed to, Hey, I want to do something new. Right. So the little self-driven bias there so it's interesting that you can also kind of help them on their ways sort of like as a parent you are a dungeon master here right well i mean which which is helpful you know as as a dm because like you control the environment Mm -hmm. right like i mean this is all kind of kind of uh and and so so it's very much like a controlled experiment and and so you can kind of predict based on class based on the rules of the game and and what it, it gets a little dicier when it's like a fortune 500 company and yeah. you're responsible for like anticipating how your engineers are going to react to to an order from the c-suite right you know like mm-hmm. it's gonna that that's where it really gets fun and if you can figure that out effectively you can make a lot of money uh consulting with fortune 500 companies I'm pretty sure if uh, I had a, a Fortune 500 company and they found out I'm rolling dice to determine, <laughs> <laughs> I'd be I'd be out of there faster if I was, even if I was Elon Musk. Get this yeah. crazy guy out. What the heck um, is this guy doing? <laughs> Consulting I, the runes. <laughs> you know, sometimes on my mission, my mission president said he he described this example that um, he he. Um, for those who don't know, when you go on a mission, you get to correspond with your mission precedent. You're basically sitting in battle reports every week of how things are going, and he can kind of clue in. And, and sometimes, if there's enough converse a similarity between people's battle reports, he'll say something. Or and uh, and one day it was kind of I want to say people were complaining about oh I didn't get the zone I wanted, <laughs> and it set him off. And what he said is he's proposed a, a, a scenario. You have an option to move to New York and you have an option to move to San Francisco. The church is in New York. The church is in San Francisco. Sometimes to God, it doesn't care where yeah. you go because you're still going to be going to church regardless right. of city. And so I... I really, I really do think that um, we are kind of going to be doing the same thing wherever we are. And so, but it's those skills that we get along the way that make it, make it better. Now there is some nuance if you get into the gritty with that, but uh, totally don't know where I'm going with that. Sorry, folks. I'm still waking up. <laughs> no, it's you're good. 6 a.m. here. So I, I've been watching the sun come up behind you. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of weird, isn't it? Yeah. So it's, it's going uh, down here. So yeah my uh my wife is still getting over jet lag so that's rough south south america to japan big difference holy moly um yeah and um you you talked about springing a personality test on on (laughs) your your spouse Uh, i i did that with me and my wife Um, (laughs) the love buckets i don't know i did that um the color which Mm -hmm. color are you yeah, mil- the U.S. military loves the color. Um, if you were to go through right now, they're really big into that. They actually hired, the Air Force hired a, uh, um, 
I don't even know where her job is, but she literally goes around and teaches people their colors. So like yeah. she went through that thousand dollar training seminar and she's giving you this, you know, test to figure out and every time you go through a person, uh, a leadership course, it's like, do you know what color you are? So, okay. Got to pay attention to this one folks. So, um, yeah, that's unfortunate. <laughs> because to me it still misses the mark but yeah i mean that's that's where i'm at like i said i'm kind of a kind of a snob at this point and and that that's where i really think experience in the moment matters to how your personality plays out and that that, that's something that i think a lot of these personality theories Mm -hmm. are they're all retrospective so it's really hard right you know well, and, and so, so when, when I've been asked to define personality, I, I say temperament plus experiences, like temperament being baseline, and then the experiences are as varied as anything. And so even though you have a Samsung phone and I have a Samsung phone, like they're not the same phone, even if they're the same model, they're not the same phone. No, they're going to have different apps, they're going to have different things on them, they're going to function differently just by virtue of their use, you know, you dropped yours. Mm-hmm. I didn't drop mine. I dropped mine. You didn't drop yours. Yeah. Yep. My, my battery, you know, I can't leave my phone unplugged for more than an hour. Or the battery yeah. <laughs> disappears, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're different. The operating system is the same, like I said, but you know, mine has stickers on it. Yours doesn't it's their personalities are extremely different. And I think, I think we want things to be nice and neat and tidy and to make sense. And especially in something like the military, like if we can count on this outcome every time, then that gives us some security, you know, and they want it to be that way really, really bad. And it just, it just isn't, I've not met any two people that have been the same. Yeah. Or it's weird. um, If you take one test, you could be different on another test. mm -hmm. So just building that bias. So I really like that idea of temperament plus experience of how you go through stuff. Well, because I mean, it kind of it kind of answers both. Right. Like there is some some predisposition here. There is a little bit of determination in it. Like you're just kind of stuck with whatever temperament you have. But that doesn't limit your capacity for whatever. Like you can you can go out. You can figure out how to install that Windows app. I mean, they've done it on Linux, right? You run like a Windows Mm. like like what's that called like a playground or sandbox yeah. or whatever um they they figured out how to do that but you have to code it on yeah. your platform it takes and then work. you can and then you can run it it takes work it's the same thing for for temperament types uh for for my type being scheduling being on time keeping appointments like being organized i have to code it man like i it's it's not a native run program i have to code it and sometimes it's really really difficult I can do it. But then if you give me a test and you ask me these questions, are you very organized? I can say, well, sometimes, yeah. And I end up scoring off because it's, it's not asking me the right things. Right. Like, uh, so yeah, anyway, there's your experiences are, are varied. No two kids grow up in the same home, even, you know, uh, everything is constantly moving, constantly evolving. We're sort of working our way into, uh, being obsolete at every moment. Jordan Peterson has a section on this in his 12 rules for life. It was kind of interesting about how even now, like there's so many things under the current moving right now that your laptop, the moment you bring it home is already working towards obsolescence. Like Mm -hmm. everything is changing. And in a few years, it's useless to you. I mean, that's, that's evolution. It's constantly changing. Nothing is fixed. And, and, but we want things to be nice and tidy. We want them to be fixed. We want them to and, fit into a nice little just, box. They're just not like that. It just, yeah, it just doesn't work. And, you, and you'll go, you'll go crazy trying to categorize and subcategorize. And the moment you think you've got it figured out, somebody like me comes along and I'm, I, I don't fit the MBTI molds. Um, not at all. Like, especially like the way I score, I've had people who have been MBTI guys like argue with me about me, <laughs> like <laughs> as though they're like the experts uh, on on what I think and feel. Because no, if you score this way, then you must be blah blah blah. And it's like no, dude, I'm running a different app. Yes, it's not a native app, but I'm running it. I've I've figured out how to make it work on this operating system. 
That's that's why I said that um, sociology theory is just horoscopes for academics. <laughs> and um, I said that sociology instructor, professor, not so happy. But <laughs> I, I saw that recently on Twitter. I was scrolling through and I saw someone else saying it. I was like, hey, it's trending. Um, yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. But I, I think there is some merit. But like you said, some people get just so silly with how dogmatic they are. Like, oh, you got to be this way. Um, well, yeah, because it blows up your theory if I'm not. Yeah. I mean, I, I get that. Like, I, you know, we don't, we don't want to look like fools, but you got to let go of things when it's time to let go of them. You gotta, you've got to remain adaptable. But I, but I say this as someone whose native app is adaptability, right? Like, <laughs> that's, that's a native program for me to run. I run that one no problem at all. Uh, and so it's easy for me to say, hey, you got to be adaptable. But, but I, th I think I think this is what, you know, you, you hear the expression, it takes all kinds. Like, it's true. I have strengths. You have weaknesses. We can, we can work together to my, my native functioning will not be the kind of functioning that you have strength in. Yeah. And I think that's when you can apply your your um, skill as a therapist because you mentioned earlier that your phone you need to have it charged so it's like mm -hmm. okay I need to have my phone charged in an hour so your experience is my phone is going to die if I don't yeah. have it have it plugged in so that's going to influence your outcomes and your choices you make in the future so there's a little exactly. bit of predeterminism of how you're going to go about things um, you know it's kind of like people that um get betrayed once and then they're really standoffish to making lasting relationships because of you know that relation ended horribly and that mm -hmm. felt nasty and I don't want to go through that again so instead of putting myself through that I'm just going to you know not have any relationships was kind of crazy but people do that right um, or you know a hundred different options um it's kind of interesting in the military, you can kind of do different things. Punishments don't have to go strictly to like um, legal paperwork or court martial. Um, as a non-commissioned officer, you kind of get some leeway as long as you're not violating someone's rights or, or doing something crazy. I messed up once. Uh, I didn't leave a building locked. And my punishment was to go physically hand check 493 locks. <laughs> I walked 12 miles that day um, because there was no vehicles to use. Um, can anyone guess what I do yep. leaving a building now? Yep, you check the locks. I check the time. locks. And two so, or three times. <laughs> <laughs> two or three times. Give it a shake. Yep. Right? So um, those experiences and how we turn out i think i feel like what the experience is and what we learn from it if we learn anything is also influential on going forward to our next encounter sure and i mean that's that's by virtue of being a human right like mm -hmm. humans are like we we learn and if the consequences are immediate and severe enough it's like okay yeah i don't want those uh you know it's part of like operant conditioning and, and sort of classical conditioning I, I think there's a lot of merit to that. And that, that's kind of the fun of all of this is like, I'm not, I, I like a lot of different theories because they provide a lot of different like perspectives on certain things, right? So like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm totally locked in on like temperament operating system is as kind of the foundation. Uh, Erickson's stages of development. So we know kind of what to expect during each of those times, but each temperament is going to, do those Alter. those stages a little differently than each other. Um, I'm also big on William Glasser's universal needs, right? That uh, which is different than Maslow. I don't I don't think Maslow was correct. Um, Glasser has a little different idea about it, and those needs laid over on top of stages of development plus temperament, um, and then operant conditioning or classical conditioning of just like cause and effect. Like how many times has your how many times have you been burned? And what has that taught you? And so all of this kind of like builds this, this tapestry of theory, but it's all, they're all individual theories that kind of come in to fill specific gaps for me, right? Um, and then when something else comes along better that, hey, this, this better addresses this thing, cool, throw out the old one, plug in the new one. Um, 
let's see how it works or, or modify the old one with information from the new one. And do they work together? Is there some synergy to be had there? Uh, you, you literally can just study it. And that's why there's literal career, there, there's research fields about this just because the, the intricacies of it and how things yeah. play. And, and then inside there, there's like subdivisions, Jungians, Freudians, anti-Freudians. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just all over the place. So, right. um, so if you're young and you, you want to go to school and you have the, um, uh, you're inclined to try to make a name for yourself, sociology may be your route. <laughs> uh, there's 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 room to grow right <laughs> um, which when trying to tie this back to like spiritual drive and how to have really keep that resiliency and to be strong while going through life's experiences um do you think knowing personality theory helps that in any way um yeah for me it does because it kind of comes back to like, we, we all make ap appeals to things. And, and so the, this, this particular temperament theory um, talks about what each temperament type trusts and, and what we're kind of generally like what we'll look for, look for. So a certain type trusts authority and makes an appeal to authority quite often. Another type trusts logic and will make an appeal to logic. Uh, and so understanding that like, if you're in charge of like teaching a group of people and understanding you have multiple learning types in the room, you, you tailor what you're teaching to make sure you hit as many people as possible. We, we tend to go into that situation with, wow, this was, this would be really impactful for me. Okay, great. You just, you just excluded 75% of the people you're going to interact with. And so understanding kind of all of that, bringing all of that, to, to your teaching, to your, your you know, whether that's, that's classroom and secular teaching or gospel teaching. Um, it's interesting because the, the, the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John actually correspond really, really well to the four temperament types uh, as I use mm. them. Um, you have representations of each of the four types, which is really cool. Uh, and, and when you read the information that they think is important to include, it makes sense. Like each of them are kind of appealing to their type, mm. uh, which is cool. It's awesome. Uh, I appreciate that, but I have a hard time reading John <laughs> because yeah. I'm not, I'm not abstract like that. And, and his language is, is different, but to a certain demographic, to a certain type that it, is it very clicks. appealing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. I always, I had a math teacher that looked at my stuff and was like I have no idea how you got everything right but you didn't use any of the formulas or anything you were supposed to use you need to use <laughs> the formulas I'm like I yep. got the answers like um I feel like that's kind of our world yeah um it, we don't care if you get the right answer we care that if you did it the way we told you to do it you know that excludes a good percent you know if the teacher is going to be teaching you um with physical objects and you're a verbal or, you know, maybe you'll go okay, but you need to read it and there's nothing to read. You're just going to be zoning out. So right. I feel like there is something to say of that. Uh, it's interesting you point out. Um, that's how we know in the Book of Mormon that there are different authors and it would be extremely hard for it, it, nearly impossible for joseph smith to have done every single one of those and so yeah. the the leading theory is if he was a fraud he wrote the book of mormon with a massive group of people that all wrote different segments because there's no way that yeah. one author could do that because in criminology you can actually determine who wrote what documents and that's what they use in archaeology so that's when you know throughout the new testament hey this is this person's writing it's likely paul's assistant or you know right this is john it sounds like john exactly john and and that's that's been a big uh like testimony reinforcer for me of both the book of mormon and of course my temperament theories because uh yeah you i i recognize the language and the language changes especially when the book of mormon includes entire sections that are unabridged right mm. versus like mormon's language when he's abridging a record um 
again, what is what is included and, and what appeals they are making are very temperament specific. And yeah, there's no way what you would get through the whole thing is Joseph Smith's voice. Um, but instead you get a pretty fascinating uh you know, variation of, of intent and interest and, in, and in kind of what they're presenting. So it's good. I, I love it. Yeah. Person, uh, studying personality theory, I feel, um, I feel like it should be taught in high school. That's why mm -hmm. if I have the opportunity to instruct kids through homeschool, we're, we're going to have a sociology year. <laughs> right. Um, I just, there's a lot, well, um, there's and, lots and, to gain from it. Yeah, the, the 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 struggle that we have is just like what what is in favor, what's out of favor, yeah. right? Like like MBTI is kind of ruled uh, since since it was there because it it was codified, it was it was yeah. an instrument, and now you're kind of going into the cover colors thing, and then you have disc that kind of exists mm -hmm. out there, which I hate the disc five um, traits. Yeah, that that sort of stuff, and so it's really just it's it's kind of political, but also we have bureaucratized and maybe that's the word like everything so much that nobody's going to look at a, a kooky unsubstantiated theory no matter how amazing it is until it can be substantiated and until it's gone through kind of that priestly yeah. uh, canonization that exists in the secular world it, it's it's not going to catch on yeah, if I was to go publish my uh, D and D personality theory right now, I would get laughed at and right. have wasted five hundred dollars <laughs> and be called a pseudoscientist. You know, that that right. I don't want to go go on that, but uh, the academic world is too too inclined to be. You're a pseudoscientist, and if one person says it, then everyone believes that it's true, which is so stupid. So yeah, the academics are. <laughs> See, and and that, that's what I here. that's what I love about like kind of the tools that are available to us now um, with things like Substack and, and mm -hmm. podcasts and whatever, like just throw the ideas out there. Like let, let the ideas stand or fall on their own merits. You know, like I don't, I don't need the canonization of a peer reviewed journal mm -hmm. uh, to, to know that my theories stack up, just, just read them, figure them out and then apply them and see, see what observations you make in your own life. Like, the experience that you have with them is going to mean more to you than what someone's opinion of it is, right? And most yeah. of the time, those opinions are written by people who aren't critiquing the theory. They're critiquing the methodology that they never even tried anyway. They're just yeah. poking holes in it saying, well, this won't work because, and this doesn't jive with what's already been established over here. Well, of course it doesn't. I'm blowing that up like this. So yeah, I've I've got yeah. soapboxes about this too. I, I hate academia, like it, really it, strongly. It's valid. I actually just uh, shared a link. Uh, I'm on academia.edu and uh, I got recommended a electric universe theory paper. <laughs> and so I sent the link to uh, Leland. I was like, hey, I guess, you know, there is some merit to actually, you know, publishing this stuff. Because for those who don't know, um, some papers charge an exorbitant amount of money for you to post your paper and go through the whole process, um, even if it's a pseudoscience. Right. Um, it's so annoying. Right. And and so, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're out there for hire. <laughs> yeah, they're out there. Yep. Um, but yeah, I feel like we went over a lot of stuff. It's going to be real interesting to listen to again. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, though, because you have basically a, a sociologist's dream with eight children. Um, <laughs> do you notice a difference in how they are inclined by personality to respond with a spiritual mind? Um, is, yeah, is that it, a trait? Yes. And, and it kind of, it kind of comes back to like that thing that they sort of trust, you know, um, and, and this kind of dives deeper into the temperament theory and sort of breaking down the different, different temperaments. But yeah, it's, it's, it's that thing that they trust, the thing that they appeal to. Um, if it logically makes sense, like none, none of my kids, as far as we can tell, are kind of the rigid logical types. Mm -hmm. um, they, they tend to be the idealist type, which is interesting because the idealist is naturally credulous. Like they, they're born believing. 
they're born wanting to believe. They have a very strong kind of innate sense of, of intuition. And that's what they trust is, does this feel right? Does this feel like the right thing? And in fact, the more logical you are for them, like the less it really matters. It's just, do I, do I trust it or not? And so we have kind of an advantage here with the Holy Ghost, with the Spirit, and, and leveraging the Spirit in our home uh, so that our idealist children can tap into that pretty easily. Um, I have a, a couple other kids that are very much like me, uh, and it's not a trust of intuition so much as it's a trust of, of impulse. Um, and, and so for us, spiritual experiences come from kind of a, a pre determination to act on whatever it is mm -hmm. so we decide okay we're, we're all in what do you what is it and then we kind of get that spiritual witness and it's it's sort of immediate um i i believe alma the younger was this type of person this type of personality with kind of his turning point right like um elder uchtdorf is a very similar type too uh and so yeah, we, we all kind of respond differently. Again, a big part of this is going to be the environment that my kids are growing up in. Um, are my wife and I doing a good job of modeling a lot of the behaviors that we say <laughs> we want them to have? Or are we totally hypocrites? Because if we are totally hypocritical, it's going to turn off a few of our kids by virtue of their temperaments and personalities. They're going to see that, that hypocrisy and say, whoa, hang on a minute. We don't have the rational types, but the rational types are very uh protective of their autonomy kind of the more you want the more you force them to do it or the more you insist on them doing something the less likely they are to do it and that's running into their self-respect that has actually it's kind of interesting because you might be forcing them to go to church and to gain spirituality but you're degrading their spiritual life their self-respect by thwarting their autonomy not giving them the option not allowing them to choose so yeah it's uh I mean, we see it again to the, ex the extent to which all of this plays out. I don't know. I guess we'll find out later in life uh, <laughs> with how they all turn out. Yeah. Um, uh, um, parents will know how you raise your children if you're in a nursing home or not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's different. And I feel like I'm not a parent. Um, so I have no idea about that, but it's such a huge, everyone, it's such a mess. Everyone I've talked about, they're like, there should be a universal way, but there's not. And you're all there isn't. Just kind of exploring it because before you had your children, you weren't parents and then suddenly exactly. you are. And it's, right. It's, and, and so no, nobody's prepared for it. And, and so, uh, you know, we're not ready to have kids as cope. You will never be ready to have kids. Like, so you just, just got to get in and do it. That's, that's how you learn kind of what works and what doesn't. But you also need to be flexible to understand that what works with one kid doesn't work with the next kid. I think um, I have so many ideas on it. They're, they're kind of screwed. Uh, <laughs> I grew up with dogs. I always had dogs. I had my, it's kind of sad that a dog would pass away and we get a, another dog, and I, you know, a little yeah. bit after their passing, there was always a dog in the home. Um, I never had cats and my wife was like, you should get a cat because you're really lonely and this is middle of COVID and I was like I don't want a cat and then one of my friends um I played magic with was um hey I found a cat and I was like oh no I'm kind of allergic so I went over to his house and rubbed the cat all over my face and waited not allergic <laughs> not allergic not a teardrop if I did that when I was a kid I would have been sent to the ER um for anaphylactic shock um but nothing so I had no idea about a cat whatsoever. I came from that world of having dogs and cats are not like dogs, but my yeah. cats act like dogs. So I feel like we are pretty biased in how we, we do stuff. So I, sure. um, if my kids listen to this, you know, years from now, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Skinner's Skinner tried to raise his kids in a, you know, kind of yeah. a certain way, like, I mean, it, it, there's rumor yeah. that he raised them in a Skinner box, which wasn't true, but, but he was certainly, uh, Biased cognizant, towards, yeah, yeah, cognizant of like conditioning and, mm -hmm. and whatever, you know, they turned out fine. They're just people, <laughs> you know, they, and they, they're, they're relatively accomplished, which is probably the case with any dad who's like uber interested, 
maybe maybe your interest in their lives is how you are influencing them but like honestly like we'll all adapt we'll be okay we're all different you know Mm -hmm. um it's it's interesting when you think about where you come from and how your parents are to how you turned out Um, and now you're seeing how your children are turning out that's just it's just all interesting it just shows that environment and experience play and how you you get Mm -hmm. through it so for sure um, I think we've had a really good conversation Um, yeah I think you've got things to do I definitely appreciate it uh i'll resend you that link so you can en- enjoy my yeah i i, my I got the link it just yeah it required a oh. uh, it required you to I give swear me permission I, so i always look to do that <laughs> anyone with this link can do it and it's always like hey can they use it and i'm like i thought that's what that meant <laughs> <laughs> anyone with the link can open it i thought that's what that meant like, yeah no i'm i'm excited um, to read it so see what uh, see what you've come up with um it got like a 99 so awesome um which based off the instructor i don't i don't know how well they'll create that some instructors <laughs> are honest they're like you guys are failing there's only two of you who are passing this entire course um, right so i don't know I, I i've had instructors that haven't read my stuff because they, they start to and they're like uh all right this is probably pretty good I'll give you a 92 <laughs> all right cool fine yeah like um i'm in i'm a in a disciplinary undergrad and um, my capstone project was very focused on my specialty. And my program instructor has no academic course house anywhere near. We're talking like football fields in other states different. And all he was doing was looking at, did you write? And did you do it the way you're supposed to? And that was it. So. Yep. Uh, I kind of wish it was like a dissertation where there was actual review by my peers. Like, is this guy talking nonsense? Cause I don't know. I had to go yeah. share it with a couple mentors of mine to see, was I kind of talking out my butt here? See any, any more, man, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't subject myself to <laughs> peer reviewed anything. <laughs> just throw it out to the, just throw it out to the world and see what happens. Like, I don't, I don't need a bunch of butt kissing academics to like review my stuff. Well, as an interdisciplinarian, um, I can definitely peer review um, your stuff if you ever want to yeah, publish. Yeah, so I'll, I'll keep, send keep me in the DMs. But <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it, Adam. This is a really great conversation. Yeah, man. Uh, for people who want to follow you, where where can they get you? Um, so I'm, I'm most active on Twitter. Uh, my, my handle is just at J-A Eberts, E-B-B-E-R-T-S. Um, I also have a, a sub stack, uh, which is like a, like a blog. Um, that's mechanicsofpersonality.substack.com, or you can just go to mechanicsofpersonality.com and sign up for the newsletter from there. And it just kind of gives a little, little bit about what we're doing there. Uh, and you can contact me directly from there if you want. Um, but yeah, that's it. If, uh, if you're coming to Twitter to look for me for just like temperament and personality takes, you're going to be disappointed. I, I dabble in everything. So yeah. Uh, sorry about that. But Hot, hot mic. That's what yep. you uh... You're it, so. <laughs> yep yep um, but yeah it's awesome and uh you have a really great day appreciate it hey man thank take you care yep we'll see you thanks